we have a solar eclipse in the sign of Aries conjunct the wounded healer. And it's an eclipse that's going to bring us into contact with a devil's comet, the mysterious undertakings of CERN, where they're going to smash some particles together on the day of the eclipse and an interesting cycle with the Mars Saturn conjunction in Pisces that reveals to us a pattern around this kind of eclipse historically around the words a leader stepping down unfortunately massacres as well as the energy of assassination so we're going to talk about all of that in the world astrology part called mundane astrology but in this video today we're also going to address how this eclipse influences you based on the energy of mars and saturn co-joining in pisces that cycle is a part of this eclipse because even though it's in the sign next door one back from aries it is the ruler of the eclipse mars doing something during the eclipse and therefore kind of baking in a signature from this eclipse on April the 8th that will play out in our lives individually for the next two years as well, of course, collectively. So when you're listening today for the all signs portion, please make sure you listen for your sun sign and moon sign. If it's about your career, it's your son, career and purpose, or father, father figures, the moon, your body, your mind, your home, your nest. And if it's your rising sign, which is often the most accurate, you're listening for everything about your life because this is the most about you playing the character of the rising sign, the sign where the eastern horizon was at the time of your birth in the western tropical zodiac, okay? So first worldly astrology, remember, mysterious spooky particle collider, the Hadron Collider, Collider in Switzerland, France, is firing up after being dormant since 2022 in the nick of time for this eclipse and doing their particle search for dark matter on by replicating the big bang on the eclipse whoo that's weird shit when to see the placement of asteroid shiva you're going to really open your eyes as you look at shiva the destroyers role in this eclipse vis-a-vis -vis cern but also the weird other stuff where mars and saturn have come together during north node and south node eclipses in aries over the course of history those times were by the way 1966 to 68 1994 to 1998 because there were two uh conjunctions of saturn and mars together back then one in march of 94 one in march of 96 each one opens up a two-year narrative and of course here we have march of 2024 the two of them coming together in the sign of pisces while also baking in this eclipse energy for the next year or more who and as you know guys X marks the spot. The eclipse is going to make an X through Texas. Texas is going to be a hotbed, a hotbed for the world in the next year or two. Because the other eclipse of the Libra solar eclipse last October also swathed through the United States, making that X. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to begin by talking about the mundane astrology. But if you're new to my channel, welcome. If you don't like mundane astrology, don't worry. There is the personal all science content that follows it. I also would let you know that I am a Western tropical zodiac astrologer. I use fixed stars, especially love the minor asteroids. Today we'll be talking about Apophis and the enemy of the sun god Ra that destroys worlds. And we'll also be talking about the asteroid Shiva the destroyer, who also, by the way, saved humanity. So there's a, there's a sacrificial nature of this energy, Shiva in the sky opposite this eclipse in Libra. I also want you to be aware that last time I did the video on this, it came out two weeks ago, I covered the chironic element, how this is a chironic healing for each of us. And so go listen to that video for understanding how you're healing something in your life that's been disturbed or not right since 2019. And this is a blowout eclipse that eclipses the wounded one, Chiron, in order to reveal and heal something for you. So that separate video is already out. It's pinned to the top of my channel right now, but go look for that uh, Intense solar eclipse in Aries is a headline video by me. Now, let's talk mundane astrology, shall we? And before we do, if you're new, like and subscribe, hit the notification bell if you're live in the live premiere. Don't forget to hit the like button as well and help the channel thrive so I thrive as well. And then we all get along here and <laughs> I have a viable career. Um, somebody asked me more than once on my channel why I'm always focusing on particular types of world events like United States politics 
well, because I'm Canadian, I live next door, because if I cover everybody's politics all of the time, it's hard. But I did talk about Prince Charles becoming ill or stepping down from the throne. I talked about that in several videos before he announced prostate cancer. So to be aware that I do do mention these kinds of things. And when it comes to world events right now, I understand there's a war in Ukraine. When that war was on, I had three videos come out about that war when it first started. So right now, the biggest thing that's preoccupying the, the world's attention, the most riveting story in the world is the Israel-Gaza conflict. And that's why I bring that one up because I don't have time today or any day on a video to do the problem in Taiwan, the problem in Give me a few other places that are having great struggles. I know there's genocides and difficulties everywhere. The Taiwan-China problem, Ukraine-Russia problem, these are ongoing. But what's riveting the world and could lead to World War III, guys, is Israel-Gaza. So that's why I'm focused on Israel-Gaza. And we'll focus on that. Something else when it's gone, right? We'll focus on the next major like thing that rivets the attention of the world. Okay, so there you go. That's my answer. All right, so first of all, let me just talk with you and then show you the charts. All righty, I want to give you some stories. Uh, get get your tea or coffee or glass of wine. I'm trying to make it more of a, a, a bedtime story. Devil Comet. Okay, there's a comet, the Pons Brooks Comet, that's going to wish through the uh, close to Earth so we can see it. Um, it's like a ball of dirty ice. And when it gets near the sun, it starts to glow. And it's called a Devil's Comet because I think it has two wisps of, of the way it glows, looks like wisps of devil's horns. Um, but this is a comet that's been around before. Every 71 years, it becomes available for us to witness with telescopes, sometimes visibly. Now, although the ancient world considered comets to be harbingers of doom, negativity, disease, and downfall, there are also evidences in the ancient Babylonian Mesopotamian tradition that the color of the comet can convey the the, the benefic or malefic quality of a comet, for instance, green or blue would be good. These are colors that they consider to be a positive omen. Keep that in mind. Because of a, a solar eclipse blotting out the light of the sun, there is an idea that this comet will be alive and visible somewhere near the Jupiter Taurus energy. Jupiter Uranus are in Taurus right now, more closer to where Jupiter sits in our Western tropical Taurus part of the sky. And if you're looking for the sidereal place where Jupiter is sitting, you need to go back 23 degrees, which if you trundle Jupiter backwards, 23 degrees from Taurus, of course, he's going to be in the sign of Aries. But if you will look to that part of your sky, you may see this comet on the eclipse. So keep that in mind. Now, second thing is that things happen in cycles. And when this comet was coming through the world in 1950, I wrote it down because I thought it was so darn freaking cool. Good things happen in 1954. Good things happen. Lori does not have a teleprompter. <laughs> Good things happen. 1954, this comet became a swoosher through our solar system. And we had the development of the microwave oven, we had the birth of the first industrial robot concept, robots, microwaves, technology, and we had the first max vaccination with the polio vaccine, which, by the way, saved a lot of lives. And so we had advances here that were very positive during 1954. So I want to say, don't always think a comet is going to bring calamity and doom. It may actually have a benefic and positive effect in the face of a very intense and powerful eclipse. Um, when I think of microwave oven, and I think of CERN colliding and the birth of the robotics first industrial robot, but more microwave oven. CERN uses high-powered microwave energy as part of how it powers up the collider. I just read that. And they have like literally powered this baby up in the last two months, which is interesting because it's often like kind of expensive to cl clash particles and it's often kind of sleeping. And they power this baby up, a big collider, like a racetrack that goes under France and Switzerland. And they whiz, whiz, whiz those particles and protons up to high speeds so they can smash them together and get evidence for how things really supposedly work. So dark matter is this mysterious thing that, that they're looking to understand. And they, by smashing particles and recreating the Big Bang, apparently maybe that can be understood. Now, in the conspiracy occult stuff right now, the big story about this is the story of maybe they're going to open a portal to some interdimensional dark side and, and, and negative entities are going to come slipping through. To tie it in to more esoterica and religious and spiritual uh, occult stuff, the eclipse is going to make an X through Texas from the eclipse path of 
you know, totality that happened in the Libra eclipse on the south node in the fall in October. Now this is the north node solar eclipse uh, coming through Aries and our tropical zodiac. And Texas is a very important place in the world if you're into the conspiracy stuff. Four red heifers, which are female cows that are virgins basically, bred with a perfect red coat with no blemish were created, I think genetically modified by very fundamentalist born again Christian types, <laughs> I believe, in Texas because they want the Messiah, which is Jesus, a spiritual return of Jesus to come to the world. And that's going to happen when Israel gets its perfect red cow with no blemish to do the 10th sacrifice, which in their cosmology, the 10th sacrifice of 10th time they sacrifice a cow with no blemish, the red heifer, and then pulverize all bits of the, the cow into ashes and then anoint themselves with sandalwood and ashes to purify the people, purify them from the fact they've been with a dead person, they touched a dead person, they've been at a funeral. These are ways of being ritually impure in the more traditional Orthodox Judaic, you know, super religious Hasidic, Hasidim, Hasidim side. And they're, they're wanting, see, the, the Israel people, I don't mean every Jewish person, but certainly the deeply spiritually religious Zionistic. Zionism does not make you religious. Zionism can be, you can be a Christian Zionist. You want the Jews to have their own homeland. And the, you know, the 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 Brits were Zionists. They tried to get uh, the Palestinian space for the for the Jews back before World War II, even. So Zionism is kind of like Jewish people get to go back home to what lands they think that were there were there were theirs historically. The religious component, which is usually seen in the ultra-Orthodox religious sects or right-wing sects of the Israel country and also around the world, is looking for the return, the, 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 the coming of the king of the Jews. And they don't mean like a spiritual leader. They mean like a political leader. They're wanting to see the coming of their king. So when Jesus was around, I know when Jesus was the king of the Jews, so to speak, Jesus was a spiritual teacher. And the Jews were looking for a king. And when they realized he wasn't going to rise up and overthrow Rome, they snitched on him. And the Romans were like, whoa, somebody's saying they're going to be the king of the Jews, the Messiah, the Messiah. We don't want this guy. And they crucified him. And then the Christians later on hated the Jews for doing the crucifixion. And that's why you have that earlier conflict in ancient history in Rome and the ancient uh, you know, times of the, the Christians being angry at the Jews. Now, sorry about this. This is a lot, I know. So hang in there with me, would you? Those four red cows are because the Christians, fundamentalist Bible types, believe, like the you know, apocalypse, the book of Revelations, the return of Jesus, you know, floating on the eastern horizon on a horse or something. All that's going to happen when the Jews get to go all home back to their homeland. Now, it's not because of a love of the Jewish people. It's a desperation for the return of Jesus, right? The, the Messiah. And so they're participating in a support of Netanyahu and Israel because they believe that if those cows come, those cows are now in Israel. They've been there since 2022. As of 2024 to 25, they're three years old. You need a cow that has that age, that age, and no blemish and no like brown hair, white hair, and amidst the the red color or the the reddish brown. It's very strict. And what they want to do in this sort of cult-like way is they want, they've got a whole ramp built now for the massacre of the cow. And it must be done this year. It must be done this year. The cow will be too old. So when that cow is massacred, then the Jewish people can't reclaim the temple. And the temple is the, the, their old temple of Solomon, one destroyed way back in the day, like by the Babylonians and the next one destroyed by the Romans. The Romans were 70 AD. And they believe that temple is under the mosque, I think the Dome of the Rock and, Rock and the Alaska Mosque is there, that belongs to the Arab world. And they believe they have to take that space back fully, reclaim that space, the temple, to build the third temple. Funny enough, I just watched like a kind of like a science documentary. And a guy with ground penetrating radar, but it's not that kind, it's like heat radar to see, you know, if the sun bakes down on the sky in the middle of the day, and then you can use this kind of heat sensing radar to see what's under. And there is like a temple complex in the same dimensions and shapes as is, as is specified for the Temple of Solomon. It's not underneath the Dome of the Rock. It's not underneath the Alaska Mosque. Is that crazy? Is that crazy? This is in Jerusalem, just, just so you know. It's nearby. <laughs> Where there's some trees next to the Wailing Wall. And so even though there is a temple there, it does not necessarily require the destruction of the mosque. This is very controversial. 
because the place of the mosque is hard to figure out historically. Okay, it's somewhere near this part of Jerusalem on the mount, right? Temple on the mount or something. So get that's my basic understanding. Now, the reason I'm thinking about this a, a certain collider, Shiva the Destroyer, which is um, the archetype that's on the Hadron Collider outside the outside CERN. They have an archetypal sheen, the Shiva the Destroyer archetype, Hindu god of destruction, so creation can happen, but the same Hindu god. Thank you, Louise Eddington, who took a poison for humanity to save humanity. Go uh, watch her, I'll put a link to Louise Edding, Eddington's deep dive into the Shiva the Destroyer archetype, the CERN story, and the archetype of sacrifice in Chiron. It's a really worth listening to. But um, it's kind of like there's a religious eschatology, messianic uh, obsession going on here for both the United States, the fundamentalist Christian movement, which supports a huge part of the United States government, especially the Republican Party, co-opting you know, this event of the war in Gaza in order to help the Jews achieve their stated goal of reclaiming the entirety of their homeland and returning the temple to themselves so Jesus could come back. All right. And technically, they're not really wanting anything that good to happen to the Jewish people. They're, they just want their Jesus story to emerge. And the Jews are thinking, well, if they get the temple back, then their true king, which means politician, not religious spiritual leader, will return as well. And there you go. That's, that's the story. What do you think? In the comments below, when you listen to this story of a sort of messianic, ultra-Orthodox spiritual religions compelling great devastation and war, and maybe even inciting a third world war with the, in, now the, the Iranians being really pissed off and the United States getting into the mix as well, what do you think? Is this the apocalypse, the Armageddon? Is this the end times that, that the Red Book of Revelations is always talking about? So I'd love to know your comments. So there we go. Now, this comment, though, coming through the sky could be a harbinger of good. That's what I was trying to say. So devil's comment may bring some good things to us. And the CERN particle collider may indeed discover something positive about dark matter. Rather than op opening a demonic portal, <laughs> I heard a Jewish spiritual tradition or no, was it Christian tradition, spiritual person on a YouTube channel saying that the particle collider was going to open the gates of hell so that something was going to come through that would indicate the spin-off to Apocalypse and Armageddon. So there you go. So there's a lot of conspiracy about dark matter collisions during an actual eclipse. Okay, there you go. I think that the, the collider could discover a fundamental truth about the nature of reality that benefits our technology, like the microwave oven, the birth of an industrial robot, and the polio max vaccine that saved many, many lives back in 1954. Moving the story forward, I want you... I want you to think about cycles upon cycles within cycles nested within each other. It's like it's like God's clock, right? Little gear shifts are moving within each other and cycles overlap in certain ways. And the cycle that we're gonna be talking about today in relationship to the eclipse of um, April the 8th at 19 degrees of the sign, 19 degrees of the sign of Aries. And by the way, it's 19 degrees and 23 minutes. So if you add nine and 10, right? 10 and 3 and 5 is 15. And 15 is the devil card in the tarot. We have the devil's comet and it is the devil card in the tarot. You can't make this shit up. But the devil is two people chained in bondage to illusion and delusion. And, and, and really, it's not about, you know, devils. It's about the bondage of human consciousness in this matrix of it's the unreal real that we're living in. And so who's to say, that there's not a unchaining from our bondage rather than a rechaining. Let's think positively, shall we? So Mars and Saturn are a synodic cycle. Every two years, they come together in the sky. For example, they did come together in the sky in the sign of Aquarius. I'm going to give you those dates because we're not focused on that, but it's worth you knowing that, yes, they came together in Aquarius for two cycles in a row. Oh, my handy notebook. And when you need it, it's probably not cued to the right page, but we shall figure it out. Yes, they came together in March of 2020 at zero Aquarius and April of 2022 at 24 degrees of Aquarius. So that was the story. And I'm an Aquarius rising and any other Aquarius has been feeling a lot of Mars Saturn. That's foot on the brake and gas pedal at the same time. Frustration, a sense of you know being stuck or being able to be very disciplined and focused in a perseverant way. All those energies were around us, active forbearance, you know, going for it with steady incremental gains. Okay. These were Aquarius people getting a lot of that story starting in March of 2020 
to to now to 2024 because remember the april 2022 conjunction of saturn and mars set in motion this story that's now completing here april of 2024 i'm really glad for it myself it's been hard okay as an aquarius rising and uh, so reflect on that now there's another cycle what about in tropical western zodiac saturn and mars coming together in the sign of pisces right when has that happened in our history before? Well, it happened in 1936, January, add two years. It happened in 1966, February, add two years. So 66 to 68. It happened in 1994, March, add two years. 1996, March, add two years. So really, we're saying in 1994, spring, through to 1998, spring, Saturn and Mars co-joined in the sign of of a Pisces. And finally, again, here it is. We're having it again. So for us to compare our own lives to the cycle, and it's really, I'm doing a whole video on that one. I want you to think about those ages, times in your life, if you're old enough, especially 94 to 98, that Pisces part of your natal chart is where this conjunction kept setting itself up. From 94 to 98, you're under this energy field. But what about the eclipse? What about the eclipse? Were there eclipses during those cycles in the rinse repeat nature of reality that had any bearing on what we're having happen today? And remember teasers, assassinations, step downs, voluntary step downs of world leaders and massacres. Okay, let's remember, I'm trying to tie together North Node Aries eclipses with the, the Saturn, Pisces, Mars conjunction cycle. Okay. So we're going to go into that in detail because, yes, there are some interesting correlations. Now, just in terms of the very super interesting basic narrative, okay, way back in the day, okay, we had October of 1968, we had a lunar eclipse in Aries in October of 1968, while Chiron and the North, Chiron was also available. So we, we're talking about Chiron because he's conjunct this eclipse. So back in the six, 1968 time period, we had Chiron in Aries and we had eclipses in Aries and we had North Node eclipses. So North Node, Chiron, Aries. This goes back to 1968 and 69. And then we had an eclipse, albeit lunar versus solar, on the 13th of October of 1968. What happened back then? What could it be that could replay this time around with a chironic war wound on the North Node with an eclipse in Aries? Lyndon Baines Johnson, the then president of the United States in the year of 1968, was in March, but the eclipses reverb through the whole of 68-69, decided to step down from his um, candidacy. The incumbent president decided not to run because his results in a primary were so bad. Do you guys know if there's any incumbent and present president of the United States of America who may step down before the election? Yes, that gave way for the Republican candidate, Richard Nixon, who petitioned uh, his platform of election on stopping the Vietnam War to win. Do you think that there could be a stepping down of Joe Biden before the election and maybe another presidential candidate who wins, who's yelling about we'll stop this Middle East war no matter what? I do. Now, Trump is an opportunist and he goes with the winds, right? He's the kind of guy who's going to sniff the winds and go with the winds. He's not internal, you know, this is my internal integrity. So if Trump does now become the candidate who lasts, which he will for the Republicans, probably putting Tulsi Gabbard as his running mate, his platform will have to include something to do with moderation with war. And he was shocking people by telling Netanyahu in an interview, like by proxy, you must stop this war now. It's enough. It's enough. You see? So he's already positioning himself to be like, no, this is too much. We must stop. And therefore, it reminds me of Nixon coming in, petitioning that he's going to stop the Vietnam War, be responsible for the end of that war, as Lyndon Baines Johnson's Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was a Democrat stepped down and it was somebody Humphreys who tried to run, I think, but in, the point being he didn't win. Now, what also happened back then in 1968, 69? We're going to go for the assassination story. Remember, we're tying together this Mars conjunction to Saturn in Pisces that happened in 1966 to 68. It's that two-year window. So in 1966, 68, not only did a, a presidential candidate stand down, but Robert Kennedy was assassinated. 
So we have an assassination of a major political player and we all, who would have probably been running, I think, for that election. And we also had the um, stepping down of a president. And of course, we had a presidential election. The election was in the fall of 1968, and then the inauguration was in January of 1969. So I would expect to see those stories repeat. Let's see what happens. Put your comments and thoughts below. What do you guys think? I'd love to hear. I love reading comments, especially about the mundane astrology. Okay. What else do we see in repeating patterns? Now, please remember, I'm only covering the Gaza-Israel situation because it is maybe a world war, war, a tipping point into a world war. So it's not like I don't care about Russia, Ukraine anymore. I did three videos on that back in the day, right? It's not where my attention is going at this point. I will note that Pluto Mars came together in a conjunction around February 13th, and we saw the Super Bowl. Was that the Super Bowl massacre? We saw a massacre in Rafa. We saw a, a, a funding of $15 billion going to Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel. So the war machinery that Mars is a part of with Pluto, which means brutality in war, and also money in war, power in war, is very active right now. And now Mars is coming into this Saturn conjunction while this eclipse is in the sign of war. Chiron was the the mentor of the noble warrior. And there's no noble war going on these days. It's very expedient. It's power, greed, and religious fanaticism. So let's talk about the next thing that overlaps the cycle. So we would say a fall of an exalted leader, right? Like falling. Icarus is involved in this eclipse, an asteroid for something falling from the sky. Exaltation of the sun means an exalted solar leader. And so we did see Pope John Paul dying, so an exalted solar leader dying back in one of these eclipse cycles of April 8th, 2005. No, we did not have the Mars-Saturn conjunction, but we still had an eclipse at 19 degrees of Aries in April 8th of 2005, and Pope John Paul died. So there was even his funeral on the day of the eclipse. So there's the fall of an exalted leader. And Prince Charles married Camilla Bowles during that same time frame, and that was a big deal because everyone thought it was kind of scandalous, I suppose. I don't know. But I'm wondering about is playing out again with the royal family and maybe Prince Charles announcing that he's passing the baton to his son, William, in when? In the year that follows the eclipse. Now, let's go back to Gaza for a minute, all right? I'm going to grab my notes for us, and then I'll take a chocolate break, and we'll do the all signs. If you're liking this kind of content, and you're finding it provocative and interesting, don't forget to hit that like button, and I will be showing you the Shiva, the destroyer cycle as well. You'll find that fascinating with the asteroid in the mix. Okay, so let's go back in history just a little bit, please. So the last time we had eclipses through this part of our sky, right? We're just not even going to focus so much on the Saturn problem. We're just going to, well, we will. So we had a Saturn Mars in Pisces problem from March of 94 to March of 98 with two separate conjunctions in Pisces over those four years. So back in 1994, right? Back in 1994, when, notes, when we had an eclipse cycle running through here, by the way, um, Let's see, where were the eclipses in 1994? I have it in my notes. Do, 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 do. It was a Libra North Node, Aries South Node eclipse cycle, but was reversed. Instead of the North Node in Aries, it was the South Node in Aries and vice versa. Libra North Node and South Node in Aries. So flipping, flip the script back between August of 95 and August of 97. Those were eclipses in our sky during that period of that, that window of time, as well as Mars and Saturn conjuncting in the sign of Pisces. Let's break this down for some shocking parallels about massacres and assassinations and, and leader falls of leaders. So I want to remind you, I'm talking about 1995 to 97. We had eclipses in the Aries axis and the Libra axis, so they were switched north node and south node, 94 to 1997. We also had March of 94, right, a uh, conjunction of Saturn and, <clears throat> and Mars and Pisces, as well as March of 1996. So we're overlapping the Mars-Saturn conjunction in Pisces with eclipses moving through Aries and Libra. And just a reminder, the nation of Israel has an Ari a Libra rising, meaning that Libra represents its identity and Aries represents its open enemies across the way. So anytime we talk about eclipse cycles involving Aries Libra, the reason Israel is going to be involved is it's going to involve the ascendant of Israel itself, the nation, and Aries, the enemies across the way, open enemies, right? All right, so let's talk about this, 1994. 
1994, they had the Oslo Peace Accords in 1993, right? The Oslo Peace Accords with Yasser Arafat, an early iteration, an attempt of coming to some resolution about the lands and who gets what in the in the Middle East, all right? There's a lot of misunderstanding about that, but I'm not gonna explain that to you now. Um, so there was the Oslo's Peace Accords. It basically is what Israel wanted, Israel was gonna get, and, and the United States was a lawyer for Israel. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was an attempt at peace. And, and there was a very important factions within Israel who were Zionist, fundamentalist, or ultra-Orthodox people who did not believe this was a good direction to go. And so there was the massacre of the Cave of the Patriarchs. It occurred when a man, this happened in 1994, and remember, we're tracking that 94 to 98 Mars-Saturn cycle, as, long, as well as the eclipses that were moving through this part of the sky in 95 and 96 and 97. Now, you might say, oh, it's not exact. Those eclipses are moving through there, the, you know, exact dates. Let's get them. Nom, 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 nom. You know, 1995 summer to 1997, but there are kind of like a pre, pre-window reverb for all eclipse cycles. That's when the nodes shifted. Um, I mean... I've seen eclipses literally come into being a year before. So we do have overlaps. So the Cave of the Patriarchs Massacre by Ibrahim, well, Ibrahimi Mosque, in a mosque. And the Ibrahimi Mosque happened. And a guy, a, a doctor of all things, who, a, what kind of doctor kills people, named Baruch Goldstein, who was an ultra-Orthodox right-wing Zionist, massacred people on a Jewish holiday called Purim, 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 as well as it was Ramadan. So we have Ramadan going on in the Middle East right now for the Arab world again. And this was a story of a guy going in to a mosque where Palestinian people were doing their prayers or doing their religious observance. And he killed 29 people and wounded 125. And he himself was then killed. Now, it, some people called him a hero and a martyr. And who called him a hero and a martyr? The ultra-Orthodox Zionist, real, super religious nutteries of Israel. And at the time, Prime Minister Rabin called him a degenerate murderer. Now, it's interesting because in 1995, after this, Rabin was assassinated by another ultra-Orthodox Jewish person. And so we have the assassination of Rabin, we have an assassination of Robert Kennedy, when we see the combination of Mars-Saturn coming together in Pisces with eclipses in the Aries-Libra axis. Finally, in 1996, because Mars and Saturn co-joined in 1996, March, at two years, in 1996, we had a war called the Grapes of Wrath. Now, that was one of the code names that Israel loves to give, like this is the Iron Swords War, and now this is the Grapes of Wrath. I'm sure a lot of you heard, by the way, that they used, a, a, um, what do you call it, a AI protocol called Lavender to target um, Hamas militants, whether they were generals or not. And the subprogram called Where is Daddy to target them when they came back into their homes, where their women, their children, their aunts, their father, their, their nieces, their nephews were living, as well as people in the stories or floors above or below them. And Israel decided just that the protocol would be that it didn't matter about collateral damage, that you could definitely target that with a drone strike or a, a dumb bomb and, and just basically blow up the whole building. This is trending. It's not making this up. This is out there. This was an Israeli publication, I believe, that exposed this through um, whistleblower intelligence in Israel. So if you want to think about some atrocities in war and brutality, think about what's really going on here, guys. It's like insane, which is why 70% of the victims are women and children of the 33 known dead, and there'll be more under the rubble. So not to depress you, I want you to know how cycles repeat, because I'm worried and where I'm going with this, that this cycle is going to come back to haunt us. And I think the only way I can see it being as bad as it has been, like the cave of the patriarchs, is uh, Israel's going to blow off the world and invade Rafa, and that military offensive will look like a massacre. So the cave of the patriarchs massacre happened back in 1990. February of 1994, in this cycle of the Mars-Saturn conjunction, and I and I gave you those dates. I, I don't want to repeat them. Um, what, what my little Mars paper is handy. That was you know, 1994 March. Mars-Saturn came together. So this con conjunction junction happens in that window of time. We have that massacre. Rabin is also um, assassinated afterwards, and then in 1996, Mars-Saturn brings the next conjunction, the Grapes of Wrath military offensive and this is what that is about that I'm, I'm thinking rafa just want you to know why am i going back over history i'm thinking this will be the uh, a rafa like operation where they're going to try to go into rafa and it's going to look really bad so basically 
And you can't make this stuff up, okay? You really can't. It was the IDF, Israel Defense Forces against Hezbollah. And basically, in 1996, they, they are attempting to end rocket attacks in northern Israel by Hezbollah. Hezbollah is just tossing rockets over the border, okay? Way more way more Palestinians and way more Hezbollah and way more Lebanese are killed. There's never an even ratio. Five, you know, Israelis die in like 5,000, you know, the Arabs next door will die. This has been happening for a long time. So basically, these cross-border rockets were causing Israel to be really uh, upset. Netanyahu was around saying, we need to return fire. He was running for office back then, but he didn't make it, I don't think. So basically what happened is the Israeli army invaded Lebanon for the second time. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm reading from pieces. Okay. Okay, hang on. It was April of, of that year, 1996, they began an intensive military bombardment of the Shia, Shia villages in South Lebanon. And it was this operation, um, Grapes of Wrath, that says it all, doesn't it? Uh, was to cause a general flight of the civilian population toward the Beirut area. Now listen to this, please listen. To cause a, to cause civilian flight, to get, to get the people to run away toward the Beirut area. They're trying to push people away from the border toward a city in Lebanon. The humanitarian crisis was intended to put pressure. The humanitarian crisis was intended to put pressure, this is Wikipedia, on the Lebanese and Syrian governments to disarm the Hezbollah. And secondary objective was to punish Hezbollah directly by destroying any objective connected to the organization. Now, they did drop leaflets from the air warning civilians that they're gonna be doing some bombs and why don't you run away? But later on, the, this writing article says, spreading panic, spreading panic among the civilian population is prohibited by international law and humanitarian law. And in a rare public intervention in an ongoing conflict, the International Committee of the Red Cross flatly condemned the Israeli attacks and further stated the IR the International Red Cross, draws attention to the fact that there are still 60,000 civilians in the area of southern Lebanon where military operations are taking place. The orders to evacuate an entire region in this, in this case, contrary to international humanitarian law issued to the inhabitants and villages of southern Lebanon do not exempt Israel from the obligation to respect the civilians on the spot. So... They also blocked the ports of Beirut, Sidon, and Tyr. So they blocked ports in Lebanon. Now, I just want to say, one of the things we've seen is this flight of civilians and this evacuation of civilians to the South Rafah in Gaza. And we have an Operation uh, Iron Swords that was called Operation Grapes of Wrath, 1996. And we see similar narratives playing out. And it's estimated that 400,000 people left their homes in southern Lebanon and 16,000 residents fled south during the bombardment of one little area called Kirat Shimona. And human rights watch people were all over this saying this is not, this is not okay. This is not kosher, I was going to say. Um, so there's a lot going on that I see rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Do you see it? I see it. Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Yeah. So I think like the cycle of 94, 95, 96, 90, you know, that window of the Jupiter, of the Mars conjunction to Saturn in Pisces, and Pisces rules displaced people, evacuees, refugees, underserved, underprivileged, the homeless. These cycles are stories to do with that kind of people. That's the Piscean story. Also, Pisces is like um, edges of water and water boundaries. And we see this playing out yet again. So if that doesn't give you a kind of chill, I don't know what would give you a kind of chill to see these cycles reading, re rinsing and repeating. And now we have apocalyptic red cows, sacrifices, ritual impurities being purified, a retaking of a temple that may not even be under the Dome of the Rock. We born again Christians thinking this is going to be the best thing since sliced bread because we're going to get Jesus back anytime soon to save everybody. And you wonder, you really wonder, you really wonder how we live in this kind of world. And I know some of you will say, well, isn't astrology like supernatural, paranormal, and mysterious? It sure is. But it's just God's clock. It tells time. It tells us what's going to happen in a repeating cycle, what may happen in a repeating cycle. So now we're going to do your sign. Your sign isn't about CERN, dark matter, particle colliders, portals to demons, red cows, 
ritual sacrifice, saving the temple. Um, what do you call it um, when you storm the temple? Because the um, the Israeli, the, the ultra orthodox right wing Israeli people believe that they only can be pure ritually pure in order to storm the temple and that when they storm the temple they'll get their king of the jews back their their political leader as well as it is the 10th time it was only 2000 years ago they found a red cow to sacrifice this is the 10th sacrifice of a red cow in the literature of the jewish people the historical literature and the 10th is supposed to bring the kind of the end of the world <laughs> and the coming of the king of the jews i mean and you know here we are who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it'll all be like totally cool. And we'll see like Jesus floating in on a on a horse in the east. And then we'll see uh, some political king for the Jewish people. You know, who am I to say, right? So um, what else did I want to tell you guys about? Uh, anything else? My notes, my notes. The eclipse is happening in the United States fifth house. That's a house that has to do with fertility, children, uh, certainly reproductive rights, um, athletes, entertainment stories, possibly. Let me grab my horary textbook by Frowley. Love that book. Okay. I mean, sometimes the best way to really crack into a meaning of a house when we're talking about a mundane or world astrology is to use a great book like this. Um, the tech, I'll put this on my book list under my videos. John Frowley's a horary textbook, just a generic fifth house meaning for the nation, the United States. Certainly I'm going to see reproductive right pro rights problems, a chironic wounded, eclipse energy and you know now there's like more and more anti-abortion law like i mean even if you're raped and you have to have the baby it's, i mean it's getting a bit nuts right and there's going to be some pushback from that maybe a healing of that wound maybe reproductive wounds as well after certain uh pandemic procedures may imply that there's some reproductive woundology like handmaid's tail going on in the world in the the world <laughs> places that used an unsafe ineffective protocol now I want to just go to the meanings of the house by Frowley for the fifth house of the United States where this eclipse is happening. United States Sibley chart is a set rising. Aries is the fifth house of fertility and entertainment and athletes. And what does Hori say about Hori? What does Hori, what does Frowley say about this? Horary. All right, hang on, guys. I didn't cue it, but I thought it'd be kind of cool to do that. I wasn't planning to. And I thought, okay, here are the houses. Horary is divination using the time of a question. Uh, that the, the sky at a time of a question to be a, an oracle or a divining tool. And okay, the places where we take pleasure, theaters, theaters, parties, and sports. Now we have a chironic wound in an eclipse in a theater, and we had a Moscow um, terrorist act in a theater. So there you go. Children in pregnancy. the father's money and profit from the querent's property because it's second from the fourth. So when you take you know profits off the table, but anyway, that's getting too horary. And that's good enough. Okay. So moving on, let's do your sign. It's been a long video. I think I'm going really long by mistake. So let me show you the chart and let's get rolling. Lots going on here. So just so you know, it's just cued for a, um, it's cued for a uh, cancer rising, but it's because everything's up at the top of the sky. I thought it'd be easier to see. Um, here we have, here we have Apophis, the asteroid that could hit the earth. Maybe I, there's a couple of timeframes where it's going to be really close and uh, enemy of the sun god Ra. Somebody in my comments said, does the enemy and the destroyer of the sun god Ra mean something good? Because our sun god's always good, right? Apollo type figures are they always good maybe not so maybe having a destroyed sun god somebody in power who goes down may not be so bad I forgot to draw Icarus in here I'm sorry let's put Icarus in because that's somebody of great power falling from power wings melting as he approaches the heights of power which is the sun and Icarus's wings melted from his dad's invention now of course it's an invention so maybe one of our inventions is going to have our wings melt I had a thought that the Antichrist is AI. Anyone else think that? There you go. So maybe the Antichrist at the end of the world is AI. Do you guys know that the Jewish people were always welcome in the Arab world and that the Muslim and Islamic peoples of the world always 
helped the Jews, even after the diaspora, after the Holocaust, anytime there was any persecution before that, they 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 brought them in and said, it's okay, you know, we're brothers and uh, you can live in our country. And there are a lot of people who don't know that. And that there is no in, uh, anti-Semitism in the Arab world. There's anti-land grab. And anti-Semitism is a particularly European problem. And basically, Europe wanted to push the Jews out of its countries, including England. Okay, so did I get Icarus in there? Yes. All right. Get your history, guys. I don't mean modern history. I mean, if you, you know, if you expunge 750,000 people and massacre them in 1948-49 in the Nakba, you're going to engender some really bad feelings, right? Okay, so and this is the top of the sky. And I think I put Icarus in. There's Icarus. So Icarus is with Chiron on the eclipse, an exalted leader, wings melting, falling from power. This is just Eris who causes wars and disruptions and discord. This is a North Node, of course. This is Asclepia, the healer. People don't know about Asclepia, that he was killed by Zeus in a thunderbolt of Zeus moment. Just a thunderbolt, a missile, a weapon just took him down because he dared to use an elixir that could raise the dead, that he was overusing it and causing Pluto or Hades to be pissed off. So I want you to keep that in mind too, because although normally I would say with Asclepia, um, the great healer is positive and it's got Chiron here as well. There was a thunderbolt that took this this guy down. And there is Venus out of dignity, the goddess of peace in the sign of war. I don't know that that looks necessarily good, but as I do this recording for my Patreon on Friday, April 5th, there is the United States now telling Israel they must do a ceasefire and bring humanitarian aid in from the Joe Biden phone call. So maybe this is Venus as peace trying to force a war in a strong handed way, strong arm into uh, end of a war. Well, and that's just hygiene. She's about hygiene and, and, and preventative medicine. Now, there's a stellium here. It's a lot of action, right? There's the Mars conjunction right there. I hope it, maybe I should have been annotating for you because a lot of you guys need annotation. I, I, I completely get it. Mars and Saturn, that's Neptune. This is all very holy war. If you don't know what a holy war is, you should because we're having one. So this is all very holy war. Neptune, a religious fanaticism and zealotry. And this is Mars war. And this is Saturn, a traditions of religion like a traditional religion, holy war energy up here in the sign of Pisces, which has to do with religion and mysticism as well. And so we have that energy breaking away over here. And I'm not going to talk about this today. This is the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, a big video coming out about that separately. I will note that Asteroid America is tracking through Capricorn for the last few months and is also tracking with Asteroid Israel, which I couldn't draw in here because the software does not draw it in, but Israel is here. The asteroid, they're tracking together and Israel and the asteroid Israel, don't try to type, don't try to write when you're doing finger finger track bat. Oh my God. Israel is sitting with America and they're both going to hit Pluto together on a particular date. I've covered that in another video and um, I don't have the date handy. I just want you to be aware that that doesn't feel so positive. Um, that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, maybe it's in my Venus notes. Hang on a sec. Just I'll do a separate video on that for one of my weeklies. They're going to cross into the place where Pluto sits. Now, just a quick note. I did want to mention Shiva. Shiva the destroyer down here was sitting with the moon around March the 24th and 5th. And that's when the CERN Collider people had their big 70th annual meeting. A week later, when he was square, um, when Shiva sits here, the moon was square Shiva. They announced that they got the particle collider dormant, I think since 1920, 2022, up and running and had their first successful particle collider, whatever. It was working again. And then interestingly, on the time of the eclipse, the moon is basically opposite this. So there's a story about the CERN collider that has been baked into uh, the 24th and 5th 70th annual meeting of the CERN folk. And then the square, the first... Um, moon first quarter square. And it's going to be a story that's going to cycle all the way through this narrative. I'm going to do that in a separate video that's going to be uh, about CERN and Shiva. I, it's too much, too much fun. I can't avoid doing that. But it's interesting that you see that Shiva, the destroyer of worlds, is talking to Pluto in a flow. And Pluto, of course, is subatomic particles and the invention of the nuclear um, bomb. And yet this is a positive energy between Shiva and Pluto, and even a positive energy between the moon and Pluto. And that forms what is basically a wedge. And all said and done, wedge, how you guys, my drawing is so bad, wedge is not negative. 
So there is something that maybe CERN is doing instead of biting our fingernails and thinking about demonic portals, maybe we can think maybe they're going to come up with a major breakthrough. Maybe we're going to develop some kind of energy device that's not going to pollute the earth because of what they learn as they collide particles on an eclipse. They know what they're doing. Like they're occultists too. There's something about there's a space probe going up into the Earth's atmosphere by NASA to see what the atmosphere is like during an eclipse. So there is something about an eclipse at a science level that is being investigated, not just an esoteric level. Uh-oh, I just wanted to decompress. I want to get rid of the annotation. Hmm. Let's go through all signs. The only point I'm making in this video today, separate from my chironic healing video on the longer video that's already out, it goes into much more depth about your sign and the chironic healing, is I'm gonna mostly address this. Why is Mars in Pisces when this eclipse is happening? What will he direct you to for two years that follow because of this conjunction that sort of enfolds itself within the eighth, the eclipse on the eighth, because it is on the 10th that Mars and Saturn will completely join. It's close enough. It bakes it in to the eclipse energy. So over the next two years, you could say the eclipse energy is baked into the Mars-Saturn conjunction. So we're going to talk about how that might look for each sign over the next couple of years. And with this eclipse being, I think, four and a half minutes long, it, Ptolemy might say something like in the ancient world, this is an eclipse that could impact your life for up to four years, not just one year. The longer the eclipse duration, the more important it is. <laughs> Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> Let me also say, I just swallowed my water. <laughs> the last eclipse <clears throat> that was in totality across the United States was 2017. <clears throat> Keep that in mind. Okay, I wouldn't look at it myself. I would stay home and be sad, Vic. <clears throat> okay. All right, <clears throat> let's get talking. <clears throat> I'm not even going to bother to stop my recording. Let's go. Aries, sun, moon, most accurate, especially rising sign. Hit the like button, guys. Basically, for you guys, you're looking at the conjunction in your 12th house of foreign countries, foreign shores, and foreign lands connected to what's going to change in your identity probably over the next, and you can go back. I always say, you know, look to history for ideas, look to history to understand what was happening in 1994 to 1996 when this was ongoing, reminding you that we had eclipses in the Libra axis of the chart and the Aries axis of the chart. And those eclipses were also happening back then, let's just say, probably spring of 95, right, to spring of 97. So spring of 95 to spring of 97, eclipses in Aries Libra, 95 to 97, where at the same time between 1994 and 1998, Mars is doing something. I would say to you, look to the Look to the eclipses of 90, look to the time of your life, spring of 94 to, to spring of 98, and compare that time of your life to the eclipse cycle energy, let's just say in the spring of 95 to the spring of 97, because those eclipses are connected somehow as well to compare notes. What was going on in your life? Holy man, what was I doing in all that window? Now, I was building my new business as a psychic reader, okay? So, and I was creating new kinds of in income from borderless income. Yes, I had clients around the world. So this is people you make money with from around the world, borderless revenue, international income can come from your 12th house. And in some way, you're back here again, but you're going to have to push through with forbearance and perseverance and lots of energy for that kind of income. But it's also very positive for having a holy war against an addiction or self-undoing bad habit or pattern that you fall away from your own self as a saboteur and to nix that pattern, habit, or behavior. I actually like to smoke cigarettes a bit back then. I was like, I would, what you call a chipper. I never got addicted, but I could still smoke them and like them. And I ended up quitting that habit in that window of time. And yet you are redefining who you are and you're healing something profound about an identity wound that has existed since 2019. To learn more about that identity wound, please go back and listen to my other video that's already out. I'm sorry about the traffic. It's too warm in my office. And if you hear trucks moving down my street for construction, 
it's I can't really change that. So I apologize. Um, one more thing I'd say about this is that you could fall like Icarus, right? I've talked about this in my other video because of over ambition and over striving. But so you you want to look at this time, you know, Mercury here is deeply invisible and retrograde as in the few months after this eclipse, you know, give yourself some break, you know, from over stress, over stress, over ambition, over like reaching, overreaching and take some spiritual downtime because the 12th house connects to the house of your soul, to past lives, the Akashic records, you know, getting in touch with the contemplative solitude part of life, going inward. And that's being asked of you as a result of this eclipse, you know, so you might kind of want to ask, can you go there um, between this eclipse and two years in order to sort of restore some healing to your own identity? I'm going on a pilgrimage to Pil El Camino, and I'm already moving in that direction in June. All right. Well, to Santiago, but the El Camino Trail from Portugal. Um, let's talk about you guys. You are, I need to move my my stand a little bit. There, that's better. Oh, I'm standing in my office because I don't like sitting and my sciatic nerve doesn't like sitting. So I'm trying to honor my body. Okay. All right. Taurus, sun, moon, and rising. Taurus, sun, moon, and rising. Guess what's happening? The eclipse, of course, is happening for you in your 12th house. I just defined that self undoing, self sabotage, addictions, revenue from foreign land, sometimes international travel. Sometimes it invites you to learn, study, or take courses in something. And as you're going to experience a massive change here, you've also felt debilitated by the chironic impulse in this part of your sky since 2019. And that can definitely look like your own self-sabotaging habits, patterns, and, and dependencies or addictions have been a, a place you're really squarely working on. And because this eclipse is also baking in the Mars ruler conjunct Saturn in your 11th house, maybe there's a holy war on this addiction that you're going to solve through the through the through the shifting of your friends, Saturn is uh, is being constricted and constrained and serious about your social groups and friends. Mars is ending, cutting, and severing. This is one of those cycles where you may indeed end, cut, and sever quite a lot of friendships. And of course, you might want to go back in time to ninety. 95, 96, when we had eclipses here along with this Mars energy. Did you peel away from some of your friends? Did you kind of have to move away from some groups of belonging? Or did you even have to make some major changes in the income source, salary source, work sources for money in your life at that time? Because this energy is back again. An elder sibling can belong to the 11th house and with a kind of a active forbearance, discipline, and perseverance flowing to you from the house of an elder sibling. There may be a rebooting of a connection to an elder sibling in a positive way for you, as this is a sextile from the 11th house to your identity, but also maybe some friends that you um, want to eliminate or they're eliminating themselves are not good for you. They're not good for your, your habits, patterns, and addictions. You know, if you're, if you're trying to get off the booze and you're hanging out with a bunch of boozers, it ain't going to work. So that kind of story, new friendship circles, groups, new ways of gaining money. But with Saturn, you might be frustrated. It might take time and we stop, start um, because Saturn is going slow and Mars is trying to go fast. And it's literally like non-compatible. But again, as I said, a disciplined way of creating your work gains and your friendship circles being changed, but in a very incremental way can be something you're seeing happen by Mars, the Lord of the Eclipse, in order to help you move into a more whole and spiritual aware and way of being in the world that doesn't include self-sabotage. If you're a Gemini, sun, moon, and rising, hang on. OMG, I'm coming back. I just need to position myself here on it. anything's better than the angle I was standing at. Okay, I'm going to close my window. Holy man. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, if you want to um, look at this in a, in a particular way as a Gemini sun, moon, and rising sun, I told you in the beginning, father, father, figure, mother, mother, figure, and all the stuff rising sign most accurate. I wish people would listen to the beginning of my videos. I hate repeating this stuff sometimes. If you want to know what, what's what. Um, 
<sighs> the eclipse is in the 11th house. It could eclipse somebody from your life, a friend, an elder sibling, somebody who you thought was your, an ally or someone who really benefited you in life, like a, a patron, a benefactor. Some kind of 11th house person can be eclipsed in the course of this actual eclipse itself on April the 8th. And because this can eclipse real people from your life, then you have to also look at what Mars says about it in your 10th house, professional, an eclipsing of some professional alliances, colleagues, co-workers, and associations. Also an eclipsing of the gains and the means of money making and gains from your career itself. It's like the salary from your career and the way you make money in your career and purpose in the 10th is coming from the 11th house. It's second from the 10th. So your earnings in your career are also changing. The means of earnings are changing. I have a progressed Gemini sun, and I will no longer be seeing clients as I do other things like write my book. And so there's a new direction for earnings for all of the people who are Gemini. There's a bit of that holy war, but there's also a bit of that frustration in, in executing these changes over the next two years. Did you make changes in your earnings structure back in 94 to 96? If you did, that cycle is back, as I said, with the Mars Saturn and the eclipse itself. It's a repeating cycle for that time frame of your life. Did you make career changes in spring of 94 to 97? If you did, 94 to 96, did you make those changes then? So I have a progressed sun in Gemini. I think it was still in Gemini at the time of the, yeah, and I think it was, but I also changed my career. Now, because Saturn is about being realistic and, and incremental and Mars is about going quickly and when they're together, there's frustration. It, the, the pace of the change may feel too slow for you. You might want to just up and quit your job or quit your career, but don't. Because when you use these two together, you have active forbearance, discipline, the ability to grind away at something in a structured and methodical and perseverant way that matters to how you wish to make passionate changes in your career direction influence your earnings over the two years that follow. The eclipse of April the 8th for you Cancers attended by a Mars and Pisces conjunction to Saturn. Let's talk about it. Go back to 94 to 96 when this is last happening in terms of both eclipses energetically overlapping from Aries Libra as well as Mars Saturn conjunction. This, this story is back in the ninth house. Did you ever, if you look back, well, no, sorry, in your 10th house of career, did some of you look at a major, a change of job, a career, work, reputation, visible status in the world, like married, divorced, widowed, single, that those things were under renovation in that window of time. So go back and see what those changes may have looked like. Now, eclipses are eclipsing a solar figure in the 10th house, and it can be a father figure. And there may be the end of a father figure connection, whether it's a boss or someone uh, one above you in a structured hierarchical, hierarchical workspace, or possibly with this, it could be a real father, father figure, you know, Grandpa Joe, your dad, great uncle, you know, Jack or something. And so just for some of you, this may be true. And so with this eclipse coming through this part of your sky, especially if you're um, looking at this as a Cancer sun, for example, okay, you have a Cancer sun, and your sun is around 19 degrees of Cancer, this could definitely look like the eclipsing of a father figure in real life, in your life. Yes, people do leave us, particularly through dying, right? Eclipses are often very accurate predictions of, of deaths of, of people we know. So that's for some of you. For most of you, this is a change of career. And you may be already feeling it because last year's eclipse at 29 degrees of Aries is, you know, always getting you in that move of a, a career direction. You're looking for a true purpose. You've been wounded here since 2019. Not to worry. That's in my other video in more depth. But Mars says, well, we're going to change your career, but we're going to do it through your ninth house. And that could be learning. Some of you will go back to school and take a, a courses in college or university or some mentorship program. Some kind of learning environment will call you, especially by the way, with Jupiter moving into your 12th house at the end of May and being there for a year, a lot of cancers are going to be called to either be teaching or learning something, most often learning, not teaching. Some of you may teach, but Mars up here in the ninth house is all about Dharma. Like what's your purpose, meaning of your life? What, what are you here for? And he's trying to blast forward, hits a, the rock of Saturn in the water. And there's a holy war of trying to 
incrementally over the two years that follow, learn, educate for career direction changes, or come into a deeper alignment with what your real calling is, your true north, and Mars is trying to help you get there, and Saturn is giving you form, discipline, and structure to achieve that new understanding. Some of you may, because of this, it really depends on your chart, if you're having a um, particular <laughs> situation where your IC is in Libra, that represents your home. This could mean for some of you, a change of home connected to foreign countries and foreign lands as a result of this eclipse over the next two years. Okay, just keep that in mind. And legal matters and court cases where Mars is sitting can help you prevail in some major changes in a place of feeling wounded in your career since 2019 by helping you slowly but surely win in the courts over the next two years. Kind of good for book publishing if you're one of those rare people who aims to publish a book that could look really good on you over the next two years with aim for perseverance and discipline. All right, Leo, sun, moon, and rising. What's it like to have an eclipse yet again in your 10th house? I want you to go back to 1994, spring to 96, spring, because that's when we had these eclipses of Aries Libra. A different arrangement, FYI, you know, north node, south node, but still the same area of sky connected to a Saturn conjunction, a Saturn conjunction to um, Mars in Pisces. This is like you're trying to make some major changes in ninth house matters. Now, in India, you could call the ninth house a father figure house, and therefore so are fathers and father figures and changes in your relationships to them that may replicate the 94 to 96 time frame, March to March. On the other hand, you may also be looking at this as some major ambitious changes in higher education, campuses and colleges, and yet at the same time, it could be an ending and a new beginning. And some of you may end up as a result of this potent eclipse going back to school to learn or being mentored or guided in some educational path over the two years that follow this eclipse. If you have any kind of um, third marriage environment, you're in your third long-term committed and monogamous love relationships like a marriage, this is the house of that. And some of you may find yourself in a situation where there's an eclipsing of the energy in that relationship as well. Usually you usually need to cohabitate for it to count as well. You can see that Mars as Lord of the Eclipse is sitting here. Mars is talking about your money you share with people, your spouse, especially your business partner, and the banks and the investment structures and the mortgages, because you're sharing that money, right? It's not yours, it's unearned, it's unearned income, it's leveraged money. So some of you here with this can have a next two years, major changes in the relationship to money you share with others as it influences decisions connected to the ninth house. Ninth house is courts, and that can look very divorcey. And for a few of you, there's major endings in relationships that can involve separation, divorce, legal matters, and financial judgments about the shared assets. And I don't want to worry you, but with Pluto in your seventh house and Mars here, just a very few Leos and Leo risings and Leo suns and moons, but Leo rising may be more accurate, may experience the passing of a spouse. Now, I'm not telling you you're 22 and your, your husband's 24 and you're supposed to start worrying. I'm giving you realistic astrology. All right, so just keep that in mind. Life happens, and I'm sorry that sometimes when life happens, it's difficult, but sometimes life just does difficult stuff. Now, it's not for two years you're going to bite your fingernails and worrying about it, right? I'm just trying to give all possible delineations. Virgo, sun, moon, and rise. How dare you mention a pet might die? <laughs> With Pluto going into your sixth house of pets. You know, see, people, honestly, wouldn't you prefer, like, prefer to prepare? Before my mom and dad died, I had dreams about it, especially my dad. And I prepared for those passings. Well, for my dad especially, because of my foretelling precognitive dreams. So using astrology sometimes to brace for challenges or to prepare for them can be useful. So Virgo, sun, moon, and rising. <sighs> my girlfriend lost her pet. She's a Virgo rising, Milo. I, I was there to help put him down when Pluto entered into the, her sixth house of pets last year. So, I mean, this stuff is what life is about. Now, uh, Virgo, sun, moon, and rising. You have this eclipse in the eighth house of chunky money, and this is very inheritancy in many ways, okay? Especially because Jupiter in the house of courts still until the end of May can indicate legal matters connected to this eighth house eclipse. But that aside, you could have some kind of money change, big significant shift 
endings and beginnings, portals regarding investments, mortgages, things to do with the money you share with your love and romantic long-term partner. Because there is a lot of energy in the house of the long-term love and romantic partner of committed love, you can see that Mars is, Saturn is making, every Virgo here has been under a problem uh, starting last March through to February 26th. Your partner feels melancholic, despairing, or depressed, or is having difficult things happen to them. Okay? And, or your marriage feels harder than it usually is, or your partner is bossy and controlling. All right, so that's been going on since last March. We'll continue to February 26. And if you're single, you can meet a very interesting person that's much older or younger by six or seven years, and or you could get into a very karmic relationship. But with this Saturn-Mars story, Mars is saying, I'm the Lord of this eclipse in the eighth house, about money I share with a significant other. And there's a major change of the status of how that money is shared, especially with strategic Athena, the lawyer goddess down here in the fourth house of shared resources and property. And Mars is trying to move quickly and bumps into a Saturnian wall just after the eclipse. What changes are you trying to make in and from and with a long-term committed marriage type partner, business associate, like a, a partner, or something in the way you reach out to your marketplace and audience that affects your financial bottom line? That's your savings, your, your 401k, your retirement funds, things to do with um, homes and mortgages and property and taxes. There's some major changes going on here over the next two years. Go back to 1994 to 1996 when the last time this thing happened. That would be a, a way to like see what changes happen in those areas of your life back then. Saturn wants to do things in a structured, disciplined way, and Mars wants to do them quickly. So perseverance and uh, is good, but frustration is here as well. And this could indicate um, partner frustration around the way sh shared resources are handled or, or managed between you, for example. Mars is in the setting place. A relationship could end here. There's been a long-term committed love, and there may be some need to look at how to separate the assets out in the way you share those resources. And there may be uh, just simply that kind of story happening here as well. The setting place is the seventh house. Saturn is hardship and hard stops. And there could be a very hard stop, a hitting of a wall on April the 10th, but also baked into this eclipse with a troubled or difficult or longer term relationship. Your partner may hit a wall and may come to a screeching halt, um, that kind of thing. Now, not to worry you, but Mars Saturn with Neptune here can look like a health challenge as well for a significant other in your life. And that may be also playing out over the next two years and maybe affecting the way your financial structures work in your life because you share money with that person or resources, or home. Libra, sun, moon, and rising sign. Here we have an eclipse that's in your seventh house. You might want to compare this because it correlates to eclipses in your seventh house connected to Saturn conjunct Mars back in 94 to 96, spring to spring. If you can go back that far, if you're old enough and not a little kid, for instance, what was happening for you in the house of your significant marriage and relationships or in the house of your audience, marketplace, and clients, significant others, legal vows, and contracts. Now, energetically, having this intensity in your natal seventh house, right, can mean it's going to be an eclipsing of a significant person in your life, or the marriage, or the long-term commitment, and you're not in charge of it, right? It's a, it's a destined, you don't have a steering wheel on a roller coaster of life eclipse, you know, there's nothing you can turn this this track on or off, right? It's it's North Node eclipses are and South Node, they're about destiny, fate, and ways we have contracted to experience our life. So you might look back, as I said, 94 to 96. Did you have major changes in significant marriage type business partners and client relationships? Eclipses just mean change. And something can begin and end here. North node eclipses for Libras who are single can often bring very destined new marriage type partners into the into the relationship or ask you to expand the terms of the agreements and the, grow get a bigger pot for your relationship to grow in. But, it's, but all eclipses, whether they're south node or north node, are destabilizing, 
because they're asking for some significant change or else in that marriage house, in that significant relationship house, okay? So you got change here. And this is a big total eclipse and it's a big, big, big deal. Don't forget the Libra eclipse on your ascendant last year is doing the same thing. What do you want in significant business and love partnerships? What do you want in terms of client relationships and where you focus your career? Because 10th house from the 10th, your seventh is that career outreach space where you reach the marketplace for whatever you're doing in the 10th house. You shake your hands here with your agreements, with your deals and all of that. Let's make a deal at your seventh house. Mars is talking about it from, and you've been wounded in the seventh house here since 2019, right? So that's in my other video more in more depth. Mars is Lord of the Eclipse is saying some of the challenges in the legal house of agreements and vows and relationships and clients are going to be effectively changing because of what Mars is accomplishing for two years in your sixth house of work and work routines and health and health routines. So there's some significant changes to those parts of your life. Mars is bringing them in a house of his joy. Well, he has to cope with slow moving Saturn. Sometimes it can look like you are grinding and very actively perse persevering and persisting and being extremely hardworking to accomplish some career successes over the next, what, two years. But at the same time, it is impacting the way you exist in relationship to major other people in your life. It could even be the end of a relationship because your work takes over your life. It could also be the beginning of a relationship because your work takes over your life. So which way is it gonna go? We shall see. All right, let's keep moving. Mars and Saturn here, discipline, form, and structure around ways to improve your health and to avoid sickness. And over the next two years, this Mars-Saturn conjunction is going to ask you to be more adept and more structured and more disciplined around health, especially with Mars. You can use surgical matters. You can use things to do with exercise and moving your body and motivation and movement. Um, and that's true for two years after this conjunction. So, But it's also baked into that eclipse. Okay, I'm going to take a little chocolate break and come right back. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. Thanks, guys. I swear. <laughs> chocolate. God's gift. God's gift to humanity. All right, let's move into the story. All right, let's talk about Scorpio, sun, moon, and rising. And we're going to get you down through this eclipse story, guys. We want to go back to 1994 through to 1996 when you had not only eclipses with the north node, south node axis through Libra and through uh, Aries, but also 1994 to 96, you were under the spell of a Saturn conjunction to Mars. And those stories are back again. Now, this is an eclipse in the workhouse, and a lot of Scorpios are going to be eclipsed from their work. You work here. It's your colleagues, coworkers, employees. It's also pets and rental situations. The eclipsing of a pet, you know? Go figure. The eclipsing of a job, someone in the work environment being eclipsed. You've been wounded in the work environment since 2019. Go watch more details about that work wound in my longer video that's already out about the chironic wound and this eclipse. You may also suffer some health challenges, and then we get eclipsed the health challenge. Let's get rid of the health challenge. Now, this energy of the sixth house can also involve rental situations, tenancies, and tenancy agreements, or the ability to pay off or pay down or receive debt elimination, right? Eclipsing your debt. So there's good for debt elimination as well over the course of this eclipse time frame in the next year or two. But this eclipse is also talking to a Mars who owns it next door in the sign of Pisces. And Mars may indicate here that in this Pisces-Mars conjunction, last seen 94 to 96 in terms of its two-year influence, that as an eclipse is also connected to Mars's house, that Mars may say the following, you are going to be really working hard and grinding at some creative entrepreneurial business over the next two years. You're going to be working hard at your creative projects and art, and you're going to be very disciplined, especially with Neptune, photography, filmmaking, storytelling, and music. And or you're going to be working really hard in the romantic part of your life. And you're going to be applying diligence to it. But when we're talking about six house matters, which are mostly around work, we would say that your work is going to be taking a turn, a change over the next couple of years that have to do with how you can apply more focus to the fifth house. And ultimately, Mars is saying, well, what drives you to be more passionate? 
and more active and more excited about something that you're doing in your work or on the side of your work. With Mars Saturn here, there could be like a hitting the wall, especially at the eclipse or a couple of days later with a child, your children are here, but also your significant romantic love partners. And where do you kind of hit some kind of difficult terrain maybe around the time of this eclipse, but then what are you doing with it? And, and in some ways, I'm going to only say it, you know, possibly could mean that some of the energy of hitting that wall will imply you could hit a wall with your partner when it comes to debt. And because of the Jupiter Uranus in the house of shared resources, the financial situation between you and a significant partner in your life, if you have one, could be in a big kind of crisis and reinvention mode over the next two years. Um, because, you know, Mars is the ruler for you and he's in the fifth house flowing back at you. This is a Mars-Saturn conjunction. I'll be doing a whole video on this separately that actually favors you in a much more positive way than you would imagine. And I'm thinking I'd say to you guys, whatever Mars is putting this kind of hard stopped intensity in, I mean, it was happening for us Aquarians for the last four years. It's also about that ability for you to be super powerfully, sober-mindedly realistic about matters of the fifth house, about fertility, pregnancy, and children about your creative and romantic projects, about how you want to harness something at the entrepreneurial self-starter level. And yet at the same time, you're taking care of business around money and debts and situations to do with work and work routines. I mean, you could end a job to start your own business or your own company if you wanted with this kind of eclipse for sure. All right, let's talk about you Sagittarius's. Go back to 94 to 96, okay? Because in that March to March, you had not only a, the output pouring story of Saturn, Mars in conjunction in Pisces, but South and North Node eclipses through Aries Libra. You're going to find some similarities if you dig backwards. And this is eclipses in the house of romantic love and children and fertility and creativity. And so a lot of you may have had some major changes here about those parts of your life, including maybe, you know, the birth of a child, right? Or including the beginning of a new romance or the end of an old one that had to, had to come to, to an end for some reason. So you're looking back at 94, you know, 95, what was happening to, into 96 back then. Now, eclipses here can be about change in relationship to a child, especially with uh, Venus here in a state of her detriment, a relationship that's been challenged, not so friendly with a child, major changes as well. You've been feeling wounded here in the house of children, romantic and sexual love since 2019, perhaps. Go and creativity, go back and listen to my longer video that's already out, the Chiron video about the healing element here. But Mars conjunct Saturn not seen since the 94 to 6 time frame, is also about your home. This is an exile expat kind of Mars when he's down here. And he's baking in a two-year window in which you may want to definitely travel a lot from your home or move or change your home in a steady, incremental, and, and dutiful, responsible way. Mars could like cut out yesterday and Saturn say, wait a minute, let's be cautious. Foot on the gas pedal break is a cliche, of course. You want your dream home. Mars is going to ambitiously find it for you in the next two years. Saturn's going to say, whoa, hold your horses. Because whatever this dream home is, it may involve children, creativity, you need an artist studio, it may involve your romantic love partner. It may involve those kinds of people in your life in order for this change to occur over the next two years. And your children, of course, belong to the fifth house. And Mars is the lord of the house of children, is speaking to you that maybe some changes you want to make, construction, exit, move, change your home dramatically, significant change, um, is dependent on certain conditions to do with your children or your romance partner or your lover or things to do with your entrepreneurial and creative activities. Saturn's the elder, Mars is the cutter, cutting the elder in the fourth house. Just want to, you know, that that's a separate story I'll be doing, but that can look like, um, you know, grandpa or grandma or something uh, getting ready to exit stage left. Uh, and as a result of this, and the eclipse rules the house of inheritance, the moon that's obscuring the sun rules the house of inheritances. For some of you, Sages, an eclipsing of an elder in the family system could lead to some inheritance money that helps you to eliminate and pay off. Well, no, just probably eliminate and pay off debt because of the Jupiter Uranus thing in the sixth house. 
All right, let's talk about you, Capricorn, Sun, Moon, and Rising. If you go back to 94 to 96, of course, you'll see that there was not only South and North Node eclipses in Libra Aries, but also there was the energy of Saturn conjuncting um, Mars in the sign of Pisces. And that's the closest we have to a rinse and repeat time frame. You might want to consider what was happening back then when it regard, come to ma comes to matters of your home, where you live, your private life, mother and relationship to your mother. These are fourth house meanings, but also connected to themes of the third house, travel, skills-based learning and education, writing projects in our modern day, emails, phone calls, blogging, uh, websites, you know, the whole virtual neighborhood where we get all the news that's fit to print, right? At the gossip at the local you know, community you know, center or store to, you know, what you get through your blogging and your social media profiles, et cetera. So back in 94 to 96, that might not have been as true, right? So it might have been your things with neighbors, local neighbors, a younger sibling, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, and nephews, extended family members can be in your third house. And those people are big on your radar, 94 to 96 in some fundamental way <clears throat> where you were feeling like this is travel <clears throat> you know this is a travel house short distance travel commuting maybe even traveling domestically indicating maybe some of you capricorns were doing a lot of travel it may have felt like a hardship as well back in that time frame and it's compromising or connected to major changes in your home and private life maybe even changes in where you live or changes in the nature of the friendliness in your domestic domicile, home, and private life. Certainly an eclipsing here of a solar figure could be a father figure, and maybe some of you 94 to 96 um, had to travel or move or do some changes in your neighborhood, neighbors, relations, because of a loss of a parent or grandparent, a uh, male father, father figure type vibe, okay? Go to check the chironic healing. When you have a wound here since 2019, you have felt like you don't have a home, metaphorically or for real. There's a wound of home for a lot of Capricorn energy people, sun, moon, and rising, especially moon, but all, all of you could feel it. And you, you might find that this is like, you're trying to blow something out of the water here. This is a total solar eclipse and North Node expanding you. Rahu means foreigner, some with strategic Athena. Some of you might find your true home in a foreign land over the course of the next couple of years. And then this, kind of third house thing is it can be about moving. You know, we, we actually land in the fourth house, but we prepare the move in the third. It's like that it's the it's the pre preparation time for the actual move. And interestingly, um when we get money from a sale of a house or whatever, uh, or from an inheritance from the legacy wealth of the family, that comes into our life often in the second from the fourth. And that's where Jupiter, the god of bounty is and plenty and luck and money luck and money fortune. So some of you may have some money fortunes coming through, selling of a, sell of a home, a property, a connection to a legacy matter, an inheritance, a will. Sun does rule your house of inheritances up here. So unearned income. So looking for some more money could look like a story revolving around money you take possession of that allows you to travel, to move, and change your home and heal the wound of not having your true home. Because a sibling in general can be here, not just younger, some of this bounty can come through a sibling and some and legacy wealth from a sibling as a result of what I'm seeing in the sky. All right, Aquarius, sun, moon, and rising, I am one of you. We have this energy in our sky, like we had it in 94 to 96, with Saturn conjunct, conjunct Mars in Pisces. Well, at the same time, eclipses were happening through Aries and Libra. What was going on back then? Try to compare it to now. First of all, the eclipses are about third and ninth house matters. These are travel, uh, domestic and foreign, things to do with learning and skills-based learning, neighbors and neighborhood uh, Eclipses bring change, a change of neighbors, a change of neighborhood, a change in things you're doing in the online world, virtual neighborhood as well. Writing as well. 94 to 1996, I was living in Washington, D.C. And 94, I moved to Annapolis, Maryland. And so there was a change of my neighborhood. You know, it's pretty close. Annapolis and D.C. are about 45 minutes away by car. But I changed my neighborhood as a result of this eclipse cycle back then. So this stuff works, but also I was, I like you was experiencing the Mars in the house of earnings. You can't make this shit up, but not only did I move from DC and I had a real estate license there, for example, and I was trying to do that, but I moved to 
Annapolis, Maryland, and I started my own career path making money in a psychic readings business. The second house is your income and the money you can generate through save money, possess money, possessions, um, some, just earn some money through the second house, resources financially. And my resources changed Mars because I began to make money in a new way, but it was because of the move. I, I did it because of the move. That's a long story as to why, but I, I couldn't practice real estate anyway. In DC, it was sucking. I didn't have, I wasn't the person, I didn't have the gifts for it, but Annapolis was a tiny little area. I was actually north of Annapolis in Crownsville. And you're like, and there's no way I could do that job. So I had to find something new, a move, a change of neighborhood, created a new job. So in your own chart, look to that element of change. Now your childhood friends from elementary school, high school belong to the third, and an eclipse here can eclipse that friendship. One of those friendships may dissolve, fall apart, or come to an end as well. I had a dissolving of a friendship at that time as well. So from, from somebody that was like, or a neighbor friend, I was a neighbor friend that I made in DC and that we the relationship ended, not just because of the move. So neighbor friends and childhood friends and make changes here. What happened to you 94 to 96? Skills-based learning and education. I took a mentorship program with a psychic from Manhattan who taught me the ropes of how to become a psychic and do it as a profession, okay? So I learned some things. I had some changes through skills-based learning. Now, Mars is all about for you guys and for me. Saturn has been here since last year, March, and will be here until February 26. And Mars is baking in over the next two years from our solar eclipse, some sense of focus, structure, and discipline hard work, perseverance, and active forbearance around how we handle money, earnings, savings, and financial resources. Okay. And so it's not always bad, but we're going to feel a little bit of, you want to go fast. You want to go fast. You want it to happen fast. And Saturn's saying, whoa, slow down. You've got a gas pedal break going on here. Trust the process. It's going to be a two-year time frame in which you're working with this energy of passion, drive, and ambition with reasonable, sober-minded, realistic, timeframes and constraints that, you know, try to find a balance in your life over those matters over the next two years. Okay. The sun is a ruler and it's being eclipsed of your marriage house, but also your client's audience and marketplace. And you could indicate that's positively changing because of this eclipse. For me, it's definitely a change in how I outreach to my audience and marketplace because I'm changing my structure and not doing one-on-one -on -one readings as much, if not at all, by the end of this year. All right, if you're a Pisces sun, moon, and rise, and you want to go back to 94 to 96, that's when we had Saturn conjunct Uranus, Saturn conjunct Mars conjunct Saturn in Pisces and eclipses overlaying the axis of Aries and Libra. So this time around, there is a North Node eclipse in your second house. And that is going to make a major change in your finances, especially the money you have through your, you know, resources, savings. You know, if you were another day, it'd be how many cows and chickens do you have? How much land do you have? How much resources do you have to feed the survival thrival machine of being alive in a body? And so, and sometimes it's your earnings. And so that part of your chart is now changing. The way in which those resources happen for you is changing. You've been having a financial wound here since 2019. Go listen to my longer video on this wounded part of the narrative. At this time though, just like back in 94 to 96, Saturn and Mars are co-joining in the house of you. You are wanting to go fast and speed like a boat and there's a big rock and you have to find the balance between ardor, passion and rapid decision-making and Saturn, stable, slow, incremental change. So you're going to have a quality about you of being like, I got a sword, but I'm, I don't wield it without, without a lot of forethought. Um, I'm passionately wanting to move in some new direction around my finances and earnings, but I'm going to go cautiously and steady because the tortoise wins the race, not the hare. This is an archetype of how you approach life as you look at that financial wound that you've had since 2019. When Chiron ingressed into your second house of money, earning savings and resources and possessions, you've been dispossessed of things. It's interesting to see Mercury retrograde and invisible under the beams of the sun on this eclipse because he rules your fourth house of law, home, land, and property. And maybe some of you have felt dispossessed of property, land, and home, or resources from your family of origin being depleted. Maybe some of you fe finished up an inheritance and you've got nothing left. And I think for a lot of you Pisces, 
there's a lot less mutability about you because Mars is decisive. And over the next couple of years, you're not only decisive, but Saturn is realistic and decisive energy about what choices and actions and decisions you're going to make from a very mature, almost sage-like archetype. You do have a sword in your hand. And it looks across at your marriage house. Any untenable, unhappy relationships with significant long-term partners may not last. And you may be looking at changes in how you share your resources, South Node, as you let go of clinging to the money of a significant other and move into some kind of increase of earnings. But again, through a consistent, active, disciplined way. Already, and certainly with the sun ruling your house of work and work routines, a lot of this eclipse is going to be about work and work routines and career objectives changing over the next year or two. And then again, it's how you approach it as a Saturn Mars being that's in your hands. It's up to you. Again, impatience and frustration with the increase or change of earnings can be here, or the ability to eliminate debt can be here. But you can also be very much like an Aikido Zen master of some sort, okay? With that combination of the sagacity of Saturn and the warrior in flow, you know, martial art energy in the house of the how you approach your life and your earnings in the next two years. Wisdom meets action and decisions around the earnings changes that are in play over the next two years. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. I'll be doing my next video on Monday about the week ahead. My week ahead video will dive into the Saturn Mars conjunction as a standalone without the eclipse, talking about just that energy and with the quarterly turning points over the next two years to watch for, for your sign. So you can be ready and not look at life in the rearview mirror. Hindsight is 2020, but why not use foresight instead? Looking forward to sharing that video with you. It will come out probably the day of the eclipse. Why not? Eh? All right. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful day. Like, subscribe, and hit my notification bell. And um, I'm having a big party for my 60K subs. I'm almost there, about 300 away on the day of recording for my Patreon community. They get this access, early access ad free. If you like that kind of stuff, check out the perks and the gifts I'm giving you to try out my Patreon community. We have about 300 of us there, and you get more personal attention from me as well. Ciao, everybody, and have a wonderful, wonderful eclipse. <laughs>